Amen. Thank you, Brother Bobby. Well, we are in Philippians. We're in chapter 3. I was looking for something this morning because I was remembering some stuff that I was studying this week. And I'm looking in chapter 4 because I'm looking at my notes. And I, I, I mentioned something specific about verse 16 in chapter 3. But I, when I looked to confirm it this morning, I was like, it doesn't say that. Why would I have put that in my notes when it doesn't say that? And I was looking in chapter 4 because that's where I'm writing right now. And, and I have one more message to write in Philippians. Now, if you're on Philippians chapter 3, verse uh, 14 or so is where we're going to start today. But you can see the end. Well, let me tell you, I can see the end and I can't wait to get there because there's so much packed into these four chapters of Philippians. It is just an incredible little book and I love it and I cannot wait. I have one more message to write in Philippians and uh, that's the 16 I was talking about. It was in verse uh, chapter 3, not 4. But uh, you turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, and uh, we're actually going to start in verse 12, because we're going to back it up a little bit. But we've been talking about rejoicing in the Lord, because salvation is only of Him. You know, if you could earn it on your own, well then we would celebrate you. Right? Because salvation would be by you too. But it's not. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. And only because of Christ can we get or attain salvation by believing in him and the power of his resurrection. Now, if you remember, we've been talking about Paul's resume. Remember, we looked at Paul's resume earlier on in the book. And what did Paul do with his resume? Did he use it to build himself up? No, he said, I'll say it the nice way. He says, it's garbage, right? He explained it way deeper than that, did he not? He says, it's worth than just garbage. It's that stuff you don't want to step in, right? He says, that's worth laying aside because knowing Christ surpasses everything. So we looked at that, but he, and we talked about how he laid aside all of his life accomplishments for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ and sharing the gospel with other people. So we talked a lot about everything that he laid aside, but he didn't just lay everything aside when he became a believer. When he became a believer and loving on other people, he says he gained some things too. And that's where we've been focusing our time in the rest of Philippians. We started out with the new knowledge that he gained. He gained a new knowledge. Remember, his old job was to persecute Christians. And he gained a new knowledge about Christ and the power of the gospel. So he gained that by becoming a believer. Don't ever think that you're going to lose everything in life because you become a believer. Because you give your life to Christ. No, there are some things that you gain. You gain protection. You gain a new knowledge of Christ in the gospel. And then we looked at the new righteousness that he gained. New righteousness is based on God himself, that it comes from God, not from himself. It, it didn't matter what he had accomplished in life. It mattered what God had accomplished in him. He gained that new righteousness. And then he gained a new power based on Christ's resurrection. We have gained that as well as believers today. Now, in the previous passage, we introduced the next thing that he gained, and that was his new goal. Through that process of sanctification and culminating or ending in that glorified body that we one day will, will, will attain, he says, that's my new goal now. So I'm going to lean into, I'm going to press into sanctification, pressing on towards that new goal of that glorified body one day in Christ. And I don't know of many people today that are in a hurry to get to that glorified body, are you? Because you don't want to leave here. There's still work to do. I, I was talking this morning with one of our young ladies 
She turned 95 years old this week. And I hugged her neck and I told her happy birthday. And we were talking about a few things and some other people that I knew that were 101 years old and still participating every single week in a Bible study. And I love that, that God not only can give us long life, but he can give us our faculties all the way through it. I mean, this lady was so sharp. She was answering questions. She was asking questions. And the day I turned 50 years old, happened to be on a Thursday and it happened to be that that was our Bible study time so I went in there gathered them all up in our room that we met in it was in a nursing home in Jacksonville Texas and I started out with a joke and I said man it was rough getting here this morning you know because I hit the big 5-0 right some of you are like I don't even remember that day that was so long ago right it, that's what she did to me. I found no sympathy in that room that day because I told her, I, I said, I almost needed a walker to get in here this morning. And they're like, what in the world? This young whippersnapper, there's no way he needs a walker. I said, I turned 50 years old today. And then the room just went silent. And I looked at her and I could see her gears turning. And Brother Bobby, I knew that meant she had something to say. So I just needed to shut up and wait. So I shut up and I waited. And I looked at her and she looks at me and she says, 50 years ago, I turned 50. <laughs> I was like, let's just get to Ephesians because I'm going to get no sympathy from her. Can you imagine 50 years ago turning 50 that's how good God is right and when we get to eternity our glorified bodies won't break down they won't get sick they won't need surgery they won't ever need a walker or a cane or a wheelchair or anything like that we won't, we won't need any of that stuff and 50 years into eternity will seem like just a day and there's so much more to go right and then a thousand years later you're like wow a thousand years ago I turned 50 in eternity we can't even fathom that can we we don't even understand what eternity really will be like because we have nothing in this world that lasts forever do we we have nothing in this world that would be, would be eternal. But Jesus says, but you are. Your soul. Whether you are a believer or not, you are an eternal being. And you say, well, preacher, you're lying because one day I'm going to die. You're right. We all will because scripture says it's appointed unto man once to die. And he says, after that the judgment and that's where he judges what you did with what Jesus did on the cross and then you go on whether it's in heaven or hell right we're eternal it says all things about heaven we, we study about heaven and everything about it is eternal but the same thing when we study about hell everything about hell is eternal where the fire is not quenched or the thirst is not quenched where the fire does not go out right everything is eternal so we're introduced this new goal that glorified body that we will one day experience and then enjoy for all of eternity I don't think we'll celebrate birthdays anymore Bobby I don't know maybe we will but I don't think we will I don't even think we'll think about it a thousand years into eternity we'll be just like wake up what are we going to do today I don't even know if we'll sleep we'll get up we'll say what are we going to do today I know I know let's worship that's going to be amazing right I think that's why it's described as heaven we think of the description of heaven in physical things don't we we think of the pearly gates can you imagine the size oyster has to produce a gate that's about 12 feet wide? Can you imagine the oyster? God says, I can do that. That's easy. 
right? I, I'm, y'all hang a bunch of them around your neck. He says, I just need one to make a gate that you could drive a dump truck through. That's heaven. We think of it as the jewels. We think of it as a golden street. We think of it as all this kind of thing. But what about the worship? What about what we're going to do for all of eternity? We don't think about it in that way. That's the goal that Paul has introduced here and that we're going to continue on in today. If you're able and willing, would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? I'm actually going to back up. We're going to go back to verse 12. I want to remind you of the previous passage because it uses some of the same vocabulary and it spills right into our passage for today. So, Back in verse 12, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. And God's word says this, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. So he's talking about leaning into sanctification and looking forward to glorification and even likens it to a race, to like a foot race. But he's not talking about a foot race, is he? He's talking about saying, I'm racing toward what is coming. I'm racing toward what God has next for me, not just in this life, sanctification, but in the next, glorification. He says, that's what lies ahead. And that's what leads us into our passage for today. Verse 14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the passage today. I thank you for the process of sanctification that you continually work in us. That you don't just see us through justification. That you don't just see us through salvation. That you continue to work on us. You continue to make us more like you each and every day through that process. Lord, we look forward to that glorified body one day. And the older we get, the more our bodies fail us and break down, the more we look forward to that not happening anymore. But Lord, what your word teaches today is that we should lean into the process of becoming more like you in this life. Lord, help us to lean into that this morning. Help us as we study your word to focus on you for just a few short moments. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Now, before we get into what lies ahead, because I want to spend some time there today, I want you to look at the first three words of verse 14. I press on. He says, I press on. Now, when we started this, introduction a few weeks ago we talked about that same word over in verse 12 and it paints a picture that talks about the process of sanctification for you and I today he says I press on the word in the Greek there means I've made a decision I'm moving decisively towards sanctification towards glorification I'm eagerly moving towards it not just we talked about this this when we talked about the previous passage and that's why I wanted to read that as well because some of us we just sit back and we think sanctification is all of God that we just sit back and let him do it to us and here we find Paul saying no I'm pressing on I'm eagerly pushing towards sanctification I'm making a decision every day I wake up to become more Christ-like that means we act different that means we react different that means we drive different we treat people differently because we decided to do that he says it paints a picture that you're hastening towards something or you're running towards it most of us would say yeah I'm a better person today than I was when I gave my life to Christ But I didn't work on it. God just did that to me. 
I didn't run towards it. I didn't hasten towards it. I wasn't eager about it. The Greek word here is used in the Greek as, as to describe a hunter that eagerly pursues his prey. Now, those of you that are hunters, now I have your attention, right? Because when I was reading about this, I was like, yeah, that's what we do. And I'm thinking right now, you know, next month, black powder opens, you know, and my feeders aren't even going. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? I got to get up there. I got to get some corn in the feeder, right? I got to get some stuff moving or when I get up there, I'm not going to have any prey to pursue, right? There's work involved in that. And that's what he's saying. He's saying it takes work. You have to put something into sanctification that it's not just a process that happens to you. It's a process that you participate in that you can run towards, that you can be decisive about, that you can wake up every day and say, I decide today to be more Christ-like. Which means when you get to Wally World or Target or Cahols or wherever it is that you shop, right? And you get to those places, you're going to decide to be more Christ-like. Which means when you see that lady pushing that basket that's just heaping over, you're not going to race her to the checkout line. Right? I was at a place the other day, and I can't even remember where it was right now. But the lady was asking a question. She was clearly in front of me. I didn't race her up there. I pulled in behind her. Right? And, and she says, she asked a question that was obviously going to take a little bit of time for the cashier to figure out. And she says, well, go ahead and check him out first. And I'm like, it's about time, woman. Get out the way. Right? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> To decide to be more Christ-like, we should have gotten a fight right there, right? I should have been like, no way, you go first. And she'd be like, no, 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 I don't want to waste your time, you go first. And it should have been an argument, right? But no, she was like, she was being more Christ-like. She was like, it's not all about me. Sometimes it's about somebody else. Sometimes it's about leaning into someone else's needs and someone else's timeline. And she says, no, check him out first. Have you ever done that? You go up there with a full cart and you see some guy walk up with a can of, you know, beanie weenies or whatever it is. And they're like, why don't you go in front of me? Because I'm going to take a while. We can decide. We can lean into that. We can be eager about it in that way. Um, He likens it to a race. Right? We shared that passage with you last time we were in this passage three weeks ago. And then he... uh, not just a race, but a race that he wants to win. Some of us, we feel like, well, I'm in a race, a rat race, right? And and there ain't no winning it. This is a race that you're eager about, that you actually want to win. Now, a runner that's running a race, they don't, they don't win by just reading the book on running, do they? Well, we got chat GPT now, right? I, I can chat GPT it. I can say, how do I win the marathon? And they can give me all this stuff, right? And that should make it where if I just read that, I can go win that race. It doesn't work that way, does it? You got to get involved. You got to do something. If I just go to lectures or watch movies or read books on running this type of race, it's not going to, it's not going to fix it. What if I just go to track events and I just watch them and I cheer them on and I'm passionate about it. And I'm like, yeah, that's going to be me one day running across the line with the ticker tape, right? And I'm going to run through it and they're going to reward me with the trophy and all of this stuff because I've read a book on winning the race. No, we have a book that talks all about winning the race, spiritual race, right? But we don't win the race by reading the book. I told you that before that I had a young man, young man one time in the eighth or seventh grade. I can't remember which one. Anyway, it might have been ninth grade. Anyway, he came to me and he says, over Christmas break, I read the entire New Testament. And my response, because my spiritual gift is encouragement, was big whoop. That's what I told him. And I quote, big whoop. And he looked at me crushed. He was like, you're my teacher. Why would you say big whoop? And I'm like, what are you going to do with what you read? 
But you don't, you don't get credit for just reading it. You get credit for doing something, for participating in what you've learned. And then it opened up a whole new conversation with this young man. And then he saw it wasn't just a jerk. You know, for a minute there, he thought it was. But big whoop. Big whoop that we read the thing. We, we, don't, we don't win races that way. We have to participate in it. Warren Wiersbe once wrote this. He says, an athlete becomes a winning athlete by getting into the game and determining to win. You want to win a marathon? You got to run a race. You got to train. You got to prepare. You got to eat right. You got to live right. You got to do all these things. And then you got to train your body to endure for miles and miles and miles. The most, the, 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 we used to run all the time, Monica and I, when we lived in Hawaii. And we would run the Aloha Run. Chet, did you guys ever run that when you were there? He was like, no, are you kidding me? That's abusing my body. You should go to jail for that stuff. I felt like that too around mile seven or so. I was like, this is stupid, right? The most I've ever done is a race like that. And it was about nine and a quarter miles. And my goal was to finish it in under an hour. And I finally, after running it three times, met that goal. I made it like 59 minutes and something. And they want me to buy a picture. Because there's a point at about mile eight or so that they take your picture. And by the time you get in the stadium there, they've got your picture. And they want you to give them like $30 for this picture. And it shows your number. And it shows you running and suffering and dying, you know, as you're doing this. And you paid money to do this. And I'm looking at the picture and I'm like, I ain't buying that. There ain't no way. Right next to me is a lady pushing a stroller. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not wasting 30 bucks because that lady didn't start where I started. She started at mile eight, right? She just got in the frame. I'm like, they should have known better. They should have said, we need to take another picture of you because there's some deficiencies that we cannot reconcile, right? I'm like, no, I don't want that. But I can't even imagine a marathon. 26 miles? Can you, anybody ever run a marathon? Okay, we're all unfit. Okay, I got you. <laughs> You're all like me. <laughs> anybody ever wanted to run a marathon? Okay, one crazy person. <laughs> but I can't even imagine after running nine miles, when you get across the, the, the finish line, you're like, my legs don't work no more. You know, that I thought I was doing Michael Jackson. No, I'm just trying to stay vertical, right? I can't imagine after 26 miles and running for hours, it, you know what I mean, what my body would do to me for the next two weeks. I, I can't even imagine it. But those people that run those races, they don't win by reading a book. You know, I stood next to, the last time I ran the Aloha Run in Hawaii, the first time I played by the rules and I was like, okay, I'm expecting an hour and 15 minutes. So I'm going to start back here. It took me 45 minutes to get to the start line. I was so far back and I'm like, I ain't doing that again. I want a real time because that time gets tacked on when you get to the end. I was standing next to the guy that won the race. The next, the last time I ran that race, he was from Kenya. I didn't ever see him again after the stuff. When that cannon goes off in Waikiki, I was like, "Where'd he go?" <laughs> Chris, he was gone. I was like, "God bless Kenya." I'm like, that dude is a runner. He was gone. And I'm standing on the start line and I take off, and almost an hour later, I'm still passing people. I'm like, where'd you come from? Because you didn't start with me in Kenya, right? They just start filtering in from all over this race just, just to do it. But those guys that run that race, they don't, they don't win by just cheering you on. They don't win races like that. So what's the point? Spiritually, we're to run the race like we want to win. 
Like we want to cross the finish line. Like we want to be more like Christ. That means we serve differently in our church. Wherever it is God's got you serving, we serve in a way like we're running a race. Not competing against other people, but amongst ourselves. That am I more Christ-like today than I was last week? Am I more loving? Am I I more forgiving? Do I treat other people differently? We run. We lean into. We press on towards sanctification. And toward one day that thing that lies ahead. And what is it that lies ahead? That glorified body. Paul says, you remember the zeal he talked about? He, he, He says the same kind of zeal that I used... Because that was in his resume, right? The zeal that he used in killing Christians. He says, I've applied the same kind of zeal to that job as I do to my new job. Telling people that I was wrong and Jesus was right and he's worth it and he's so much better. The surpassing worth of knowing him puts away all of our world's or lively accomplishments. He says, I'm going to lean towards what lies ahead. Look at verse 14. I press on toward the goal and what is the goal here it is the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus he says that's what I'm after I'm after the goal I'm after that upward call can you imagine if that were the prize you'd run your race different right when the cannon went off Kenya would be way back there because I'd be gone right but spiritually that is our goal that is the prize that is what we're working towards and we ought to be eagerly and decisively working towards that goal we should be running the race not to compete against other people but it has to be personal we have to examine ourselves we have to say hey what 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 do I look like today as opposed to the day I gave my life to Christ Could it be that maybe some of us, we're not running that race. We're not running it it, as if we want to win it. Can you imagine a better prize than Jesus Christ splitting the eastern skies and calling us home? He said, your work on earth is done. Can you imagine that day? That's the prize that he's talking about here. And there's nothing else like it. Now, that's why Paul freely laid aside all of his accomplishments. He ran through all of his resume and he says, I'm, that's why I'm freely laying it aside. Because that call is worth it. And I want him to find me in a situation that I am way more Christ-like than I was the day I gave my life to him. My life to him. He says, that's what I, why I want to lean into it. And he says, I can lay aside all of my accomplishments because none of them are worth comparing to knowing Christ. You can say, well, well, I drive a nice car. I got a nice house. I got a good job. I got money in the bank. I got a big family, little kids and grandkids running around all the time. None of that is worth taking or comparing to knowing Christ. If you think you've got it made today, some of what you ought to be talking about is, well, first of all, I feel like I've got it made because I know Christ. He's blessed me with other things, with with spiritual matters and family and things like that. He says, but my success is based on knowing Christ. Christ. That's why Paul says, I can get rid of all of that because they're not worth comparing to that upward call that he will one day do. One day do for each and every one of us. Now, where will you be on that day? Where will he find you? How will he find you? Will you be the one that people would look at you and say, that person has decided to become more Christ-like. They're leaning in. They're pressing on toward that mark. They're trying. They're deciding every, every day to eagerly become more Christ-like as they race toward the goal, their glorified bodies. Will he find us like that? 
Or will we just be the ones barely hanging in there? Suffering for Jesus, right? We're just always down on ourselves. We're, we're just, we know persecution will come because scripture tells us persecution will come. So why do we just focus on the persecution when it comes? We ought to say, wow, Lord, you were right. Now, I am blessed and I need to impress on. I need to lean in. I need to be more Christ-like. I need to press on as if it's a race that I actually want to win. That upward calling of Christ. Look at verse 15. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, now there he's talking about all those people that still dwell in the past, that make no spiritual progress. They, they still look, act, react, treat people the same way they did the day they gave their life to Christ. He says, and if anything, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. That's personal. He says, nobody's going to come up and not wrap you on the head, slap you in the forehead and say, hello, you need to fix this. He says, no, God's going to speak to you about it. He's going he's to talk to you about it and he's going to reveal it. Then verse 16, only let us hold true to what we have attained. Paul's saying here, he says, there are rules to the race. There are rules to running the race here. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.5, it'll be on your screen for you. He says, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. You know what the fastest way to, to lose an Olympic medal is? Break a rule. It could be years later. And if they find out that you broke a rule, they're going to come knocking on your door. We want our medal back. Right? And they're going to strip you of those medals. Now, you'll never experience spiritual maturity by following your own rules. We have to follow his path and his way. And that's what this verse is talking about. He says, you have to hold, hold fast to the truth, hold fast to what he has taught us and to his word. He says that's how we run the race. When life gets difficult, we pick up the book and we lean on it and we hold fast to what we've been taught. We don't, we don't compromise it. We don't allow culture to make up its own rules and then we just follow their rules because that's what they do. Can you imagine trying to run a race and as you're running the race, the rules change. How are you going to win? How are you going to complete the race? What if you're running a marathon and you're like, I am programmed, I am trained to do this. 26 miles later, there's no finish line. And you're like, wait, what happened? They changed the rules. You know, since the cannon started and you started running, they changed the rules. Or what if you came across the finish line and you were first and they're like, you're, you're running up and you see the tape across the finish line and as you get there, they just lift it up and you go right under and they're like, no, it ain't you. What do you mean it ain't me? Well, you didn't wear a hat. You're supposed to wear a hat. That's in the rules. Well, wait a minute. That wasn't in the rules when I started the race. Yeah, but we changed it. That's what culture is doing to us. And it's as silly as that sounds to us right now, they're doing it every day. Right now, they're changing the rules. They say, well, you can't win the race because you're not a cat person. You're a dog person. If you don't have a cat, you can't win the race. You can run it. You can do all you want. You can train. You can do all that. But, you, but you're a cat person. You can't do it. Now, that I would believe. That, that, I would believe that was a rule before. Anyway. You can't win a race when the rules change all the time, right? It used to be that there was a rule. Guys and girls were guys and girls. Now the rules have changed. After we started the race, now they've changed words. They've taken words and they've hijacked words. And now they've taken some of those words and they just changed the meaning of that word. You can't change the meaning of a word. I can't remember who said it. It wasn't me. It was somebody else. Really, really, really smart. Otherwise, I would give you his name. He says, all communication stops when the meaning of words change. 
And that's what culture has done. You've already started the race running through life and they're changing all the rules. Now, what we learned in English class isn't even right anymore. His, her, they, them, all of that changes. You can call a him a her now. I'm like, wait, the rules, right? I learned those in English class, the rules. Culture changes those rules after you've started the race. And we think it's silly in the illustration there, but they're already doing it. And we are blinded by it. The rules are very specific. God has established specific rules when it comes to sanctification. There's only two. Here's rule number one. You have to be saved. You have to be saved. You have to be a believer. You have to believe that Christ came. That he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. Sins that you could not possibly pay for yourself. And have the same result. Eternity in heaven. He went to the cross for you. He went to the grave. They buried him. And Satan's thinking, woohoo, I won. And three days later, just as scripture said it would happen, he walks out of that grave. You have to be saved first. Do you remember the Philippian jailer? Watch this on your screen, Acts chapter 16. It says, then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Sanctification didn't start yet, did it? He says, I want to be saved. What must I do? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and your household. He says, you're not, you're not just going to get saved. You're going to go home and you're going to tell your whole household. And they're going to believe and they're going to get saved. But none of that sanctification process could start. He couldn't press on. He couldn't lean in. He couldn't decide. He says, no, I have been brought to the point where I know I need a savior and cannot save myself. And I... I want to know what I must do to be saved. And when he gives his life to Christ and believes on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's when sanctification started. That's rule number one. You have to be saved. Rule number two, you have to hold fast to the truth. Not to everything that culture throws at us. Not to everything, all the rules that they tried to change. He says you have to be saved. You have to believe. And then you have to hold fast to truth. And truth means truth. Not my truth. Not your truth. God's truth. You know, the truth that never changes. That truth. That's what chapter, verse 15 and 16 is talking about. And verse 15 and 16, they don't leave any room for compromise. They don't leave any room for us choosing our own path or making up our own rules. He says none of that can be changed. Anyone who adds to salvation is making up their own rules. Anyone who takes away from or takes away from scripture is making up their own rules. You remember, I think most of you remember Elvis Presley. One of his last concerts one of the songs he sang at that concert just I want to say it was the day before his death I can't remember for certain but at his last concert one of the songs he sang was I did it my way he did it his way we can't fall for what culture throws at us that hey just do life your way if you're a good person, it'll, it'll outweigh the bad deeds in the end and you, you'll get to spend eternity in heaven. And they don't even know what that means. This passage says it doesn't work that way. It says sanctification, that glorified body one day. He says, no, you have to believe. You don't get to do it your way. You don't get to make up the rules. God says there's two rules. One, believe. Two, hold fast to truth. That's what we have to do today. <clears throat> we have to live a life that's according to his command, not ours. We have to do life with an attitude of that knowing Christ is better. It circumvents all the suffering, all the pain, all the persecution, all the valleys that we go through in life and that the prize at the end is worth it. It's worth it all. Listen, I don't know anybody who's in a hurry to get on the next, next train to, to heaven. I don't know anybody. 
But it ought not to be because we're a, you're, a, you're afraid to die, but because there's work to do. Right? Paul goes through a dilemma there for a while. He's like, man, I want to go on and be with Christ, but it would be beneficial to you if I stayed. Paul understood it's better for him to stay because there's still people around him that he knows or doesn't even know yet that need to know what he knows. Christ surpasses all others. We have to go through life with, with the prize of that upward calling that it's worth attaining. It's worth going through the suffering. It's worth going through the valleys that get thrown at us. It's worth everything we go through. My question to you today is, are you eagerly moving towards sanctification, toward glorification? Are you deciding each day to wake up and become more Christ-like? God, help me today to be more like you. I cannot do it in my power. I'm deciding. I'm eager about being more Christ-like. If I went to somebody, Brother Bobby, I'm going to ask you guys to come. If, if, if I went to somebody and I asked them, would you describe for me that person? Is that what they would say about you? Would, you, would, would they say, she is pressing on toward the mark. The high calling of God. She's pressing on. She's leaning into. He's, he's adamant about becoming more Christ-like. He's adamant about leaving the flesh behind and, and looking forward to what lies ahead. Is that the way they would describe you? No, I get it. If you're not a believer today, sanctification means nothing to you. It doesn't apply to you. It's not a process that has started. It doesn't, it's not even a process that you have to look forward to. But it can be. Jesus says the first rule is just believe. It's just believe that I did what I did on the cross for you. To pay for your sins. That you had been separated from God by sin. And that there was only one way to reconcile that relationship. And that's with what Christ did on the cross for you. He says, just believe. When you believe, the process starts. That's when sanctification takes place. That's when it starts. That's when that process means something to you. Listen, I don't know what your need is today. I'm going to ask you to all stand to your feet. We're going to enter a time of invitation. This is where I invite you to do business with God. I don't know what your need is today, but I'm inviting you to do business with Him. If you don't know Him, step out. For those of you worshiping online, dial that number on the screen. Someone will call you back. They will take God's word and they will share with you how you can know Christ. Paul says knowing Christ is bigger and better than anything. Everything that you can accomplish in life is as garbage compared to knowing Christ. Maybe you're looking for a church home. Maybe you need to be baptized and you just need to follow Christ. You've been saved, but, but you've never taken that first step of following him in scriptural baptism. You step out, you dial that number on the screen for those of you worshiping at home. You do today as we sing. You do business with God. Whether it be up here using these stairs or these chairs up here as an altar or right where you stand, right where you sit. Don't leave today without first doing business with Him. You do today as God leads you. As we sing.
Well, I want to thank you for being here today. It has truly been good to be in God's house. You be praying this week for an opportunity to share the truth. We hold fast to what we have obtained. We don't hoard it. We share it. Let's do that this week. Uh, don't forget, in a couple weeks, we have a celebration. Are there any other announcements that I need to rem What grades? Okay, I think the children's teachers have a meeting today real quick after um, the service. I do want to say one more thing. Uh, announcement. The 27th is our Harvest Fest. It is also the very same day and time as our kickoff meeting for the North Central Texas uh, BMA Association that we are a part of and we want to send a crew. I cannot go. I need to be here at Harvest Fest, but we are putting together a crew that will be able to go to Pathway out in Waxahachie and we have the Irwins coming. Many of you have heard them before. It is just a concert. It is not a meeting. You'll never hear anything about Robert's Rules or voting or anything like that that. This is a celebration of like-minded churches that are fellowshipping together. We have two brand new vans. I want to run both of them to that meeting. So if you are not a part of Harvest Fest this year, coming up the end of this next month, if you're not a part of that and you want to go hear a great concert that is already paid for, you don't need tickets. I don't know if they'll take an offering to try to offset some things or not, but they may. But they are amazing. I have been, I've been to one of their concerts before. They're amazing. So if you're interested in that, um, you let us know. I know my dad and Miss Carolyn are going to that as well. You can let them know. Um, I'll be talking to Bob on our VIPs. Some of those might want to tag on to that. We're going to run both vans out there. So if you just want to ride, you don't even have to drive at night. It's going to be in the evening. That's a Sunday evening. So that will be a great time for you to participate and be a part of our local association. So be a part of that as well. Let me pray and we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, it's good to be in your house. Lord, give us an opportunity as we go our separate ways to share truth to a lost and dying world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Amen.